and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. Hello, Jennifer. Hello. Happy fancy Wednesday, Sandy. Yes, and it's <laughs> fancy meeting you here. <laughs> How you doing? Just happens. I'm doing yes. good. Just I hope happens. everybody's doing good. They've yeah. been having a pretty intense uh, chat there in oh, the really? pre-video, yeah, and talking oh. about the shooting. Oh, right. shooting in yeah, Texas I started talking Dallas. about that last night. I needed to have a little catharsis. It's just suck yeah. ass. It's just suck I ass. Know. But we're not going to talk about that suck ass because no. we have a beaver show. <laughs> and we are going to talk about Arctic beavers. <gasps> and we are going to talk about... Um, Actually, we're going to talk about something that we've never really talked about, I don't think, with a, a, a little wrinkle with permafrost. Mm. Oh, yes. Something yes. different. Yep. Something so, different uh, with the yeah. permafrost. Those of and you who think you know everything about permafrost, not so fast. Not so fast. That's right. Not so fast. Mm. Not so fast. So, so Sandy, shall I yes. Yes. give the 36,000 foot overview? Absolutely. Go for it. Right ahead. Yeah, so we've got a couple of little articles, two about the beavers, actually, one that's older from February and another one from Anglia Ruskin University. So the first one is from Wired, and this was actually published February 26th in Alaska. Beavers are engineering a new tundra. I'm not sure if this is the beaver one we did before or not, but we're going to do it again tonight. And then uh, just did. kind of a nod to Anglia Ruskin University, their uh, half million pound project for the Arctic beaver study. So we're going to talk about that. And then <laughs> we have uh, something different in the permafrost. Permafrost thaws and could release an invisible cancer causing gas good job mm. good job and um then we have one about a new oil discovery unfortunately up in the arctic equinor the company makes significant arctic discovery well drilling reveals up to 50 million barrels of recoverable oil yeah. At Snowfon Nord near Johan Castleberg Field in the Barents Sea. That's already so. going to get the toilet flush, I can tell. Oh, you bet. You bet. And then we have one about the Arctic shipping routes. Arctic shipping routes are expanding faster than predicted, just keeping with our faster than expected, predicted, thought about anything like that. As ice melts, navigable routes have opened in ways that were not expected until the middle of this century, right. yay team. And I think that that's probably, Sandy, as far as we're going to get. We're not going to yeah. go into, you that's know, the right. multi-hours. We do have no. two articles if we don't have enough to talk about. But we're going to so. start with our these little, these little cute things, these little babies. They're so cute. They're just so cute. Okay, well, we are going to start with the uh, Wired article, which okay. I don't think we read. I don't think okay. we read, but we're going to review it because uh, there's some exciting news about new research. Okay. So I guess I could start this one. Uh, okay. Once non-existent in the northwest part of the state, beavers are both benefiting from and changing a warming landscape. And this was from February. That's why I think, I don't know. But anyway, even if we did, everybody forgot anyway. So That's true. Look how, look how cute they are. They really are cute. They're very and cute. I know we have beavers back there, at my, that we've had beavers back where I live, back on my, my creek. I know I have. I know. Uh, all right. So this used, was in High Country News, which is actually a, a publication I used to use all the time on the Facebook page. It's a, it's, it, they cover um, Colorado and the American West. It's a good publication, uh -huh. High Country News. So yeah. Cyrus Harris hopped on a snowmobile one day in early January and zoomed up a peninsula near Kotzebue, Alaska. 
uh, to break trail for his sled dogs. The first beaver dam I'm running into is about three miles from town, he said. Nearby that one is another one. About five miles out is another one. And that's just one little area. Harris, who's an Inupak, was born in 1957 and spent his childhood across the uh, Kotzeb. Is it Kotzebue or Kotzebue? I, it might be. Just I think it's say, just say it Kotzebue. with confidence. Okay. Just say Here's my confidence. confidence. Kotzebue. <laughs> but there that sounds go. Russian. All right sound in the Sisliak. So beavers were really just unheard of, he said. It's crazy the amount of beaver coming in. <laughs> They're just raiding the whole area. God. Beavers once seldom seen in northwest Alaska. They started appearing more frequently in the 80s and 90s. Pastor Lance Kramer, who's in Inupak, traps beavers today, mostly for making fur hats. Oh. Uh, no. He recently asked an elder about the area's first sightings. Well, they saw this thing on the tundra, and it looked like a wolverine, but it was really a long beaver, Kramer said. It had walked so far on the tundra to get up this way that it wore out the bottom of its tail. Oh, my something. God. We're out the yes. bottom of its tail. So now the animals oh. and their ponds, dams, and lodges are everywhere. Using satellite images of the Kotzebue area, scientists found that the number of beaver dams surged from two in 2002 to 98 in 2019, wow. which that's a 5% 5 5,000% 5, jump. Wow, that's pretty heavy. And it's that not is. just... Kotzebue. Beaver dams doubled regionally since 2000 with 12,000 in northwestern Alaska now. Beavers dubbed <laughs> ecosystem engineers because of how they flood their surroundings. They're transforming the tundra. North America's largest rodent is moving north, partly because of climate change. As the tundra grows warmer and greener, it also becomes much more inviting to the beavers, which need the shrubs for food, dams, lodges. Their proliferation is also linked to a population rebound. Beaver trapping, popular for centuries, has tapered off, and the animals, they're thriving. Beavers were recently cited as a new disturbance in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's 2021 Arctic Report Card, POO, a yearly report that tracks changes in the region. That's because they're damming up rivers and creating deeper, warmer ponds that open up new types of aquatic ha uh, habitat. The key question to ask <clears throat> wherever you're standing in the Arctic is, how long will it be before the beavers get here, says Ken mm -hmm. How long? An ecologist studying beaver expansion at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Because when they get there, it will never be the same again. So I'm going to give that one the gong. Never, never. No, we'll mm. do the gong show. Never the same. Uh, Harris worries that beavers swimming in the reservoir that supply Kotzebue's drinking water could overwhelm the community treatment plant. Beavers and other animals carry the Giardia parasite, which they excrete mm -hmm. into the environment, and water contaminated with their feces can cause intestinal infections. Harris and others used to drink directly from rivers on their hunting and fishing trips, but uh ah, -uh, today they're having second thoughts. If our water quality gets damaged, where do we go from here? Harris said. Well, I guess they have to carry mm -hmm. the eco straw with them. You know, <laughs> they're uh, not going to be able yeah. to drink because they're going to get, get diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And if you're out in the middle of nowhere, that's not fun. Uh, Selawick, about 80 miles to the east, is a beaver hotspot, too. And some are upset that the animals are blocking hunting access by boat. Elders said to start getting rid of the beavers, but nobody listened, and now it's overpopulated. <sighs> um, this is what Ralph said, the in Inupiaq. 
He's a subsistence hunter. He also works for the local airport and his town's road, water, and sewer department. Lodges up to 15 feet tall make navigating uh, sloths to hunt moose. Sloth? Sloths? Sloths. Slew. 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 To hunt moose on the periphery, cha uh, challenging. You can't even go up to some places now with a boat because it's dammed up. Ramoth said. Sometimes he tries to chip away at Beaver's handiwork, with little success. If you tear up part of a dam or a beaver igloo, they're going to come right back and they're going to fix it up again. They're just busy beavers. <laughs> Slew, huh? I have to get glasses. I think hunters like Ramoth. Regard beavers as pests, and Harris wants to see the beaver population, you know, he wants to see the control efforts. But others argue that the beavers aren't necessarily creating a better or worse tundra, just a different one. Kramer considers them a blessing for habitat diversity. They've enhanced our land in an incredible way when they do come up, Kramer said. They make lakes and ponds and bigger sloughs, which makes for more moose, duck, and waterfowl and muskrat. So scientists will continue to monitor their beaver activity and its possible environmental impacts. One major question remains uh, and unanswered. Are they accelerating climate change in the region? The pools of water that their dams create are warmer than the surrounding soil, and that could thaw permafrost and release carbon and methane greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Beavers are a major player, said Christina Schadel, a professor who studies the permafrost at Northern Arizona University. How big, we don't know, but it's absolutely worth investigating. Mm. Now, Jennifer, mm -hmm. weren't they here first? <laughs> I mean, most definitely you know, okay so if beavers were here first i mean you would never say okay beavers cause climate change it's because they have to move that climate change uh, could occur from the things that are happening due to them having to move because of human encroachment mm -hmm. correct well, yeah. And then, of course, when they move north, they just pretty much finish off the permafrost with all their beaver, busy beaver engineering ways. You know, they <laughs> flood it and they yeah. thaw it. I mean, then all that methane gas comes out and the permafrost turns to permamush and then they go further north and onward and onward. onward, and onward. So, yes, you know, maybe maybe the apocalypse is going to be set off by beavers. Oh my God. Oh, wait, I gotta go. Oh no. <laughs> I need some new sound effects. Oh. I don't have a beaver sound effect. <laughs> I don't even know what they sound like. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you're going to do this next one. And this is actually the excitement f to understand this. So go for it. It's, it's a short. Do you mean the, the, the one from Anglia Ruskin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so this cute. is from the BBC. And this is mm -hmm. Anglia Ruskin University gets half a million pounds for Arctic beaver study. And yes, they are cute. They the are. changing habitats and behaviors of beavers as they move further north into the Arctic Circle will be examined in a new study. Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge has been granted basically half a million pounds to investigate the mammals impacts as they move northwards. Researchers want to understand their effects on the landscape, fish populations and indigenous people. Project leader, Dr. Helen Wheeler said she was delighted to receive the sum. You betcha baby. The study will look at the effects of climate change and rising temperatures. The line where trees grow has moved northwards, as has the beaver, which builds dams and water pools by felling trees. They're so cute. Too. They're so cute. This, which one are you showing? 
This little one. Look at this. Oh little yes, guy. the standing, the Look standing at him. one. He's he looks very like funny. He's, he's he's like you know deep in thought, <laughs> almost like he's that guy sitting on the toilet, the thinker. <laughs> when they make the comic about the thinker, just put a toilet behind him. There's the the, the, uh, the beaver thinker. Okay, <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> so basically, this grant, this funding from government sponsored UK research and innovation body will build on studies being carried out by the university in Canada's Northwest Territories, looking at how beavers are changing the local ecosystems. Researchers will examine how beavers dam building can change landscapes by creating ponds and diverting rivers, leading mm. to fewer fish that local people rely on. Interesting. The number of beavers heading north of the tree line and into the Arctic together with the amount of new ponds they are creating have caused permafrost to melt. I'm glad that they That's said good. it might melt in the, I, I'm glad they didn't say it might melt in the future. They are admitting it has melted. Wow. You know, they're causing it to melt. Yeah. This is, now see this they're they're mixing their hopeful language again this can lead to greenhouse gases no this will lead to greenhouse gases methane and carbon dioxide being released in an arctic update for 2021 aerial and satellite images showed north american beavers had colonized the arctic tundra of alaska with the number of ponds doubling to 12,000 in western alaska since the year 2000. so the last 22 years 12,000 at least new mm. ponds new mm, um mm, mm, beaver mm. ponds in Western Alaska. That's a lot. Wow. And look at that article below it. We're not going to read it, but how they took down a, Can a, Can a Canada town's internet. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh they're yeah. just too cute. <laughs> right. Well, we still love no, them. Yeah. And guess well. what, guys? Anybody looking for a position? Because there is a PhD position announcement to be a beaver engineer. <laughs> the university of alaska does anybody want to be a beaver engineer <laughs> i'm sure there's some of you I, I i can imagine you know the the goofing around in our our chat uh, i have no this idea is, uh, <laughs> all right so anyway they're taking right. applications it'll be in the it'll be in the links and we will move on Okay. And we have a little video. Should we show the little video? Let's show the little video. Okay, let me pull up the little video. We've got just a cute little short video and let's see it let me make sure that the the sound it will be on. Guys, you will tell me if the sound's on like always. We never know with this thing. All right, let's play this little video. It's just so cute. Better be playing. Hmm. Does it have sound? Can you? The I'm soil play causing it over. ice to melt and the no, ground I'm to sink as it, it stores over. more water. Let's, uh, I'm there, starting there it over goes. because it never works. It never works, even though beavers I have made arch. the Arctic their home as temperatures warm. But these adorable critters may be speeding up climate change in the frozen tundra. A University of Alaska Fairbanks led team analyzed 12 years of high res satellite data of roughly 25,000 acres covering Alaska's northern Baldwin Peninsula. They found beavers are loving the tundra life. The number of dams in the study area jumped from just two in 2002 to 98 in 2019. That's a 5,000% increase. 
With more dams comes more flooding. Researchers found 66% of the increase in ponds and lakes during that time was due to beavers. The team noticed beavers mostly dammed streams and lake basin areas sitting on ice-rich permafrost. The beaver ponds warm the soil, causing ice to melt and the ground to sink as it stores more water. As it thaws, climate-changing methane and carbon leak from the soil into the atmosphere. Despite the influx of dams, researchers did not directly link beaver ponds to the Arctic's increased permafrost thawing. They say nature's engineers might just be inadvertently speeding up the planet-warming process triggered by humans. The study was published in the journal Environmental Research Letters. That was very cute, guys, and I do not know why the system audio doesn't work, but I'm not going to worry about it now. It just pisses me off <laughs> because I have everything set up right, and then that happens. Okay, Jen, yes. you're going to take yes. this one away. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, guys, so now we're going to turn our minds to the permafrost. We've got an article. Oh, wait, Jen, we what? have one question. I f we have one question. I don't want to lose this one. This is okay. from field. This is from field B, and this was a. Do you think it's possible that beavers once occupied the Sinai Peninsula? John D. Lowe has an ecosystem restoration pl uh, project in the planning there. Time to avoid, oh, major floods. Oh, and recharge their water table. Well, you know we don't know that, but even I don't know it. But even if they didn't, they're using them. To what? Make a natural um, avoidance for major floods? Thank you, Field B. What do you think, hmm. Jen? Well, I thought that beavers were a North American phenomena, not an Egyptian oh. phenomena. But they're doing it with they're using the using them with the project. But maybe well, will you we'll look. We'll definitely check it out. I wanted to make sure that comment came in because you asked it, and I don't want to forget it because you asked it during the fever segment. Now right. we will move over to the lovely invisible cancer causing gas. Ugh. So new variations on the permafrost. So permafrost thaws, <coughs> excuse me, and could release an invisible cancer causing gas. Oh, permafrost yeah, thaw pounds in Hudson Bay, Canada, near Greenland in 2008. That's the picture. So that's basically what the land looks like <laughs> when it's all caving in and rotting. You nice. know, it's it looks like a orange that's and that's 2008 decomposing so yeah that's 2008 yeah that's who knows we've shown like, yeah. we've shown more current ones but this one came with the article <laughs> so exactly yes exactly. they were too lazy so, to look for a new one all right so let's get through some of these bullets deep in the frozen ground of the north a radioactive hazard has lain trapped for millennia but uk scientist paul glover realized some years back that it wouldn't always be that way permafrost is an icy shield a thick a thick blanket that locks contaminants microbes and molecules below foot and that includes the cancer-causing radioactive gas radon. In Lovely. January 2022, report experts used modeling to show that homes with basements built on permafrost could be exposed to high levels of radon gas wow. in the future. The link between radon exposure and lung cancer is well established, yet scientists don't know how much radon is actually emanating from areas with melting permafrost today. So those are four little bullets to kind of get you activated. So here we go, activated. guys. Yes. Let's get activated. Deep in the frozen ground of the north, a radioactive hazard has lain trapped for millennia. Oh, I already read that. Glover had attended a conference where a speaker, where a speaker described the low permeability of permafrost, ground that remains frozen for at least two years, or in some cases, thousands. It is an icy shield 
a thick blanket that locks contaminants, microbes, and molecules below foot. It is. It immediately occurred to me that, well, if there is radon underground, it will be trapped there by a layer of permafrost, recalls Glover, a petrophysicist at the University of Leeds in England. Quote, what happens if that layer suddenly isn't there anymore? Ever since then, Glover has worked on methods to estimate how much radon, which is released as element radon decays, might be liberated as climate change causes the permafrost to thaw. Liberation! Signif <laughs> liberation! <laughs> Oh Significant areas of Arctic and subarctic ground contain permafrost, but today it is melting and the rate of that thaw is accelerating. In a report published in January, Glover and co-author Martin Blowen, now technical director at the mapping software firm Geostack, used modeling techniques to show that homes with basements built on areas of permafrost could be exposed to high levels of radon gas in the future. Quote, as the permafrost melts, this reservoir of active radon can flood to the surface and get into buildings and by being in buildings cause a health hazard. No one knows exactly how quickly radon diffuses through icy ground, but by using the rate diffusion, the rate of diffusion of carbon dioxide and adjusting for properties of radon, Glover came up with a figure that he could use in the model. Based on 40% permafrost thaw, the calculations reveal that radon emissions could raise radioactivity levels more than 200 becquerels per meter cubed, geez, for a period of more than four years in homes oh. with basements at or below ground level. This happens when 40% of the thaw occurs in 15 years or less. Oh my wow. goodness. According to... Um, the World Health Organization, the risk of lung cancer increases by about 16% with every 100 backwells of long-term exposure. Yeah. Some countries, including the UK, set the safe level of average exposure at 200 backwells. But without testing for radon in the areas where geology suggests it is present, people will not know whether they are at risk because the gas is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. Right. So, so you, another thing we can get totally paranoid about that we can't sense in any well, way. We don't <laughs> Except live on permafrost, meters. but the people that right. live on permafrost, now they just have one more thing. One, one more, more thing. thing. Mm -mm. One more thing. Glover stresses that the model in the paper is an early attempt to understand how permafrost could permafrost thaw could affect people's exposure to the gas. It doesn't, for example, account for seasonal variation in the rate of permafrost thaw or the effects of soil compaction when ice within it melts, something which could pump yet more radon to the surface. Mm -hmm. Some 3.3 million people live on permafrost that will have completely, see they use the word melted, should be thawed, that will have completely thawed away by 2050, according to estimates in a 2021 study. So they're saying 2050, all the permafrost is going to be gone. Huh? Yeah. Not all wow. these people yeah, that's what they're saying. And, you know, I've been thinking about the question. Yes, I have been thinking about the question that Rich Diana posed that I was not ready to contend with. And that was, are you in the 20 or 30 year club? So that would put us at 2050, roughly. So if we think of things in 2050 and start to imagine all the different dimensions of what is going to be true in 2050 we can start to get an idea so they're saying by 2050 the permafrost is going to be thawed basically lovely 
Lovely. Wow. Yeah. Um, and the link between radon exposure and lung cancer is well established as as is the fact that smoking further increases one's risk, said Stacy Stanifer, oncology clinical nurse specialist at the University of Kentucky's College of Nursing. She points to studies suggesting that radon could be behind up to one in 10 lung cancer deaths, whereas there are 1 million in total worldwide every year. Mm. Breathing radon is dangerous for everyone, but it's even more harmful when you also breathe tobacco smoke. So that's a one, two whammy smoking cigarettes, right. living on the permafrost, Dang. You know, smoking in your house, keeping the window shut during the winter, getting totally pickled on radon. It doesn't sound good. It's not. S Smoking is prevalent in Arctic and subarctic communities. For example, a 2012 study reported that nearly two thirds of Canadian Inuit aged 15 and over who live within the Inuit homeland said they smoke cigarettes daily. Oh, that's sad. It doesn't surprise me. The, the doesn't tobacco me industry is still strong and lying and going. <laughs> You know, I thought people yeah. would just not be smoking tobacco. Well, but when you think about it, when you have Native American ceremonies, gifts of tobacco yeah, are tobacco. always given. You, you know, know, you're right. Yeah, yeah. You're gifts right. of tobacco are always given, and tobacco is also yeah. a Native American plant. So, like the mm. beaver, maybe we have smoking beavers. Who knows? Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, smoking beavers. So, compared with 16% of Canadians. So 16% of Canadians smoke, but in the indigenous Inuit population, it's uh, much, much higher. A lot higher. Yeah, much higher. Scientists don't know how much radon is actually emanating from areas with melting permafrost wow. today, says Nicholas Hassan, a geoscientist with, and PhD student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I would call this a blank spot. In other words, they haven't thought about this before. Oh my God, they're just starting to think about this. Yeah, this it gets worse and thing. worse. It gets yeah. worse and worse. He notes that in real life, permafrost layers are complex and irregular and agrees with Glover that field measurements are essential to validate the model. Instead of a uniform sheet of ice underground, wow. imagine permafrost as more of a higgledy piggledy Swiss cheese <laughs> of ice, with some areas much thicker than others and places where groundwater courses through it, exacerbating the thaw. Hassan and colleagues have studied locations where permafrost is thawing unusually quickly and emanating methane a greenhouse gas, many times more potent than carbon dioxide, more than many, like dozens, right? Dozens of times more potent than carbon dioxide in the short term. Similar chimneys could be spewing out elevated amounts of radon oh, gases in some places. Nice. So they, now that you're getting these melted pieces of the thermo permafrost, they become these chimneys to these radon deposits that just like and there you go, into the silent vortex of radon. Right. For human health, what really matters is the amount of radon gas that gets into people's homes. Scientists and even homeowners themselves can use radioactivity detectors to assess this. A study published online in February 2022, which is yet to be peer reviewed, measures levels of radon over the course of a year in more than 250 homes in three towns in Greenland. Out of 59 homes in Narsok, for instance, 17 were found to have radon levels above 200 back walls. Oh, lead author, yeah, lead author Violetta Hansen, a radio ecologist at Aarhus University in Denmark, stresses that these are 
early results based on small numbers of homes. It would take much more research, she says, before she could evaluate the health risk associated health risks associated with radon in properties like these across Greenland. Mm -hmm. She is now leading an international project that will run field experiments and gather radon measurements from homes in various countries, including Canada and Greenland. Mm -hmm. Quote, we need to come back to the public with low cost and affected validated mitigation measures. Good luck. Good luck. you bet it is important to avoid panicking people don't panic the people do not panic the sheeple without solid data and solutions on hand says aaron good sorry a radio biologist at the university of calgary in canada there the good news is is that there are tried and tested methods of lowering the levels of radon inside a house once the homeowner knows it is there. Gudzari points, for example, to a technique called subslab depressurization in which a sealed pipe is inserted below the house and connected to a fan. This sucks any radon out from below the building before blowing it away into the atmosphere. Fear. Yeah. Think of it simply outside. like a bypass. Well, I guess mm-hmm. radon levels might go up in the atmosphere, but who knows how much. The type of building matters. Glover's model found that homes built on piles or stilts and thus separated from the ground did not experience a boost in radon levels. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Does. Fortunately, many homes in the Arctic and subarctic are constructed in this fashion. But for those that aren't, the cost of mitigating radon could be prohibitive for low-income communities in these regions. That's an uh, equity issue that has to be considered, certainly, said Gudzari, who notes that the Honest might be on social housing administrators in some areas to ensure that the housing they provide is healthy. Spokesperson for Health Canada mm. says the government agency currently recommends that homeowners test rate on levels in their properties and use certified suppliers to install mitigation technologies if such are required. Many people do not think about radon very much, given the fact that it is invisible. Glover says that getting informed now before the permafrost thaw worsens could save lives. Quote, we know that people die from it, he says, but at the same time, there's so much that we can do to protect ourselves. Oh, so there we go. Well, that's the <laughs> first one on radon, actually, right. that, I, I, you know, in the permafrost. So, right. Uh, here we go. Right. Hold on. Right. <sighs> that's right, Sandy. Hold well, on to your we hats. Have a real, a, a real fun one coming up next. A, 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 we are so, oh, no, it's the right? WASF. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, Equinor makes a significant Arctic discovery, and this is the Barents Observer, our favorite. And we'll give this one an applause. But guess what? This one, this one gets, totally gets the toilet flush. Same time. This toilet flush. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because here we go. And let me make sure you can see it. Well drilling reveals up to 50 million barrels of recoverable blah, 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 recoverable oil at Snowfall Nord near the Johan Kasberg field in the Barents Sea. Oh, this was good. This is yeah. brand new, hot off the press. It's an exciting discovery. <laughs> And you know who's going to capitalize on it? Norway, and and, and it's it, the development can add valuable volumes to the installation in the future, says Christian Westvik, Equinor's senior vice president for exploration and production. North, the discovery was made by Semi 
submersible rig transocean enabler and is located about five uh, kilometers south, southeast of the Casberg field. So according to Ecuador, the new discovery is likely to be tied to uh, Johan Casberg. The water is located uh, about 200 kilometers north of the town of Hammerfest are now considered the most prosperous Perspective, uh, uh, yeah, perspective parts of the Norwegian shelf. So total resources in the area might exceed 700 million barrels of oil equivalent. From before, Ecuador estimated recoverable resources in the Casberg field to 450 to 650 million barrels of oil equivalent. So the Norwegian state company intends to start, start, get this, to start production in 2024 with a development concept that includes a production vessel and extensive subsea infrastructure. The Casberg field is based on several discoveries, the first of which was Screwguard in April 2011, and the field license of uh, is owned by Ecuador, 50% together with uh, VAR Energy, 30%, and Petoro, 20%. The field is located in the Arctic waters at 72 degrees north, and developments are harshly criticized by environmentalists. Well, you think? Greenpeace yeah. warns against the field development, arguing that consequences for the uh, climate will be dire. The organization recently voiced its opposition to Wistig. The other major Arctic oil project developed by Ecuador. According to Greenpeace, Norway cannot open any new fields if it is to meet its climate ob uh, obligations outlined in Paris. The organization also warns against potential serious consequences for Arctic nature in case of an oil spill. So here we go, Jen. Yeah. I mean... Who out there? They're, they're never uh, going to stop. No. They're never going to stop. They're going to burn every single barrel of oil that they can get their hands on. Oh, okay. And they're Rick, never going to stop. But Rick says 700 million barrels planet uses 100 million. So this is good for what? For a week? But it's still the oh. point that they're looking for more. They're looking for more, you know, and, and it, it just, it's, it, 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 and Norway, you know, who we love Norway. We love Norway, but Norway is a, a green washing place. You know, they mm -hmm. might have their, sure. their uh, EVs and all, but the, where do you think they're rich from? They're wealthy because of this. Mm -hmm. And Thomas told us that. What did they call? Thomas said, Thomas Nilsson called Norway petroholics. He said, mm -hmm. we are petroholics. Absolutely. He did. We he did. are petroholics. Well, what do you think out there, guys? Yeah. So actually, Jennifer, we've been 44 <sighs> minutes. We do have that other one on the Arctic shipping, which is just yeah, another absolutely. example. So why don't I move on? We move on since we already yeah. know that Radio WASF still has more. Jennifer, yeah, take it absolutely. away. Take it away. Okay, guys. Oh, here's so this more. came... This came out from Hakai Magazine, I believe. Arctic shipping yep. routes are expect are expanding faster than predicted, as the ice melts. Nav navigable routes have opened in ways that were not expected until the middle of this century. So again, we're looking at the year 2050, and I want to pose this question mm. to everybody here: What is Earth going to be like? in 2050 in a variety of different dimensions. So just keep that question in your mind because you can't answer it all at once, right? As the climate warms and the sea melts, transarctic shipping routes are becoming easier to navigate, a prospect that is enticing to freight companies. These routes can cut up to 9,000 kilometers off of a one-way trip between East Asia and Europe. Compared we're on a one-way trip. <laughs> right. We're sorry. on a one-way we trip. We really are. Baby. We are on a one-way trip. And it's on all the magical trip. thinking of all these crazy people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a one-way trip to paradise, baby. <laughs> well, I've compared <laughs> with shipping through the Suez or Panama canals, <sighs> shortcuts that clip roughly 40% 
off the voyage. Well, it's really hard to resist that, isn't it? 40% less time and okay. everything. Really. So it's savings of fuel. Yeah. According to a new study, the reality of routine transarctic trade could come sooner than expected. Using satellite data on daily sea ice between 1979 and 2019, right? So that's a 40 year window right there, yep. isn't it? Do I have that right? Yeah, 40 year window. The researchers found that the safe navigation season for open water vessels in the Arctic, trips that could be embarked upon without the help of icebreakers mm -hmm. is already significantly longer than climate models anticipated. With few exceptions, most shippers avoid the hostile Arctic Ocean. But according to Kushong Fang, an e ecological economist at the University of Maryland who worked on the new study, observational data shows that rather than being commercially, rather than being commercially navigable, by the middle of the century, as so many climate models predict, several transarctic routes are already navigable for large chunks of the year, and they have been for a while. The team mm -hmm. found that open water ships could have been traveling through the Canadian archipelago along the fabled Northwest Passage for more than two months of the year during the 2010s. Captains wanting to travel between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans along the Norwegian and Russian coasts could have done so for even longer. This Northwest Passage was open for about three months of each year, long enough for freight carrier carriers to make at least two round trips between ports in East Anglia and Europe without any assistance from icebreakers. According to the researchers, these routes would have only been occasionally navigable in the 1980s. And depending on climate projections used, they were open for around two to four times longer than expected in the 2010s. And Sandy, let's do a drill down on this. Do you see these two maps, the yep. 1980s yep. and the 2010s? These are the two different shipping routes and look how different they are. In the 1980s, the one that kind of skimmed along the Russian side, the Siberia side, it went on the inside of some of these little Arctic islands. It wasn't mm -hmm. able yeah, to go on it. the, you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah my and point just is working skim by, one. oh great, and just skim by Novaya Zemlya, right? But now in, in the, now you can see it's going Ooh. right past there. Franz Joseph land, the, the, what, the, the Russian one. Yeah. And it skims much, much further in, right? Almost and right that's across. 2010. So it's right. showing you see the Arctic in two in the 80s, and then you see 2010. You think the Arctic right. <laughs> looks like that now? A no, bit different. No, we're bit 12 different. years in further yeah. along in this disaster. Or so yeah but you get the idea oh let's yeah. look at the canada one and see so in the canada one um in Where's the 1980 so that's on the um look, I have another look one. the route the right it's the same map oh it's, it's the same map I'm just, okay sorry. sorry it's sorry. a different route so yep. basically in 1980 it went uh. deep into this the side. archipelago right mm -hmm. and then in the 2010s 30 years later it could skim through a completely different route through the archipelago see oh, look at the difference much yeah. much yes. more northerly route so there yeah. you go oh, yeah yeah I see the difference. i'm sorry i thought maybe i was missing something you didn't miss a thing nope. darling it's right nope. here right, right in front here. of our very eyes Right in front of our very little very eyes. eyes to see. All right. Mm -hmm. Since 1979, the area of the Arctic that is safe for open water vessels for 90 days of the year has increased by 35%, the researchers claim. Probably. With this, the routes these ships can take have changed, as we just saw. 
For instance, the best, the best path along the Northwest Pass Passage has shifted northward from the Amundsen Gulf to a shorter route through the Perry Channel, one that was predicted to be unnavigable until the mid 21st century. Unreal. So Unreal. it's, you know, everything is melting and they just keep thinking it's going to take so long. And guess what? It's not taking very long. Faster at all. than previously expected. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Siri Valand, a human geographer at Norse, a Norwegian research center, says that while the finding that trans Arctic shipping routes can be used now is not new, limited commercial trips operated over the past decade by Russian, Chinese, and Danish shipping companies, among others, is proof enough that it does seem that the researchers have picked up a few windows for nav navigability that may have been off people's radar. Valen cautions, however, that when you have the benefit of hindsight, the Arctic looks a lot more navigable than when you're trying to forecast. Well, there's nothing like 2020 hindsight, right, guys? In you wonder what they'll say when the Arctic melts completely and there's no ice. Well, we didn't see it coming oh, until right. 2050. Gee. What is what is it? How you say it, Jennifer? We're dismayed. We're shocked. <laughs> We're shocked. Scientists yeah. are shocked. 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 I tell dismayed. you, shocked. Yeah, yeah. Shocked and dismayed. The problem that navigators face is an interannual sea ice variability. Year to year, there is a high variability in the exact number of days with low sea ice, particularly at either end of the summer. This makes sending ships through the Arctic very oh. risky. And Valen does not expect this variability to decrease for another okay. decade or two. Well, yeah, oh. then the ice is going to be gone, gone, gone. Well, at least but, the summer ice, right? The summer ice goes first. And I mean, it's really the yeah. BOE will happen. It's yeah. going to happen eventually. The BOE. The BOE yeah. will happen in September for a few weeks at some BOE point. BOE gets top billing. And not... Not the too distant future. But Fang did find that since 2004, open water vessels have been able to travel through the Arctic for the whole of September. And one of his collaborators in China who has been talking to commercial shipping companies, I bet they have been talking, discovered that they, you bet they're talking you in bet. China to commercial shipping companies you bet your baby they're like can we zoom through that ice discovered that they are already going out with ships and icebreakers and testing the routes they are just trying to explore the possibilities fang said well there you go so i mean we have covered uh, quite a bit of quite a bit of stuff we even have yeah. one more, but I don't know if we're going to have time to go through it because this, yeah. I, don't, I don't know, let's, the nuclear sub one, we could save that it's one. Late uh, yeah. It's late today. Yeah, but it, I, I want to ask everybody, um, I'm going to go back to just me and Jennifer, mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask everybody what they think of this time. Now, Jennifer and I usually do Sundays, and, uh, you know, the thing about Sundays is um, that's both of us. And I usually do Wednesday with a guest or I try, but do you guys like the later hour? Um, I don't know if we would do it this late on Sunday, but I'm just saying, do you know, let me know in an email if, what you like. Environmentalcoffeehouse at gmail.com. And also don't forget to send your gardening pictures. And I have a real I have a real funny quickie to show to tell you guys. Oh, do um, you? Yeah, the one I, I told you about. Okay, yeah. so I was on LinkedIn today and uh, I don't belong. I don't pay for it or anything, but I noticed in my profile that somebody was looking at me. So I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, in, in my LinkedIn, it says environmental commentator and, you know, retired research administrator. Well, guess who was looking at me, Jennifer? Who? 
BP <laughs> and Aramco, the oil company. Com- the, the, uh, I, that has to get another gong hit. The oil companies, they were looking oh my at God. my profile like, really? okay, do they want to pay me? <laughs> do they? Are they looking oh for a shill? <laughs> I was like, I thought that was pretty funny. It's BP, weird, right? Somebody from, yeah, it was really weird. Somebody from, because I mentioned it last night when I was talking on the uh, the impromptu show I did that, you know, uh, about, I used the article, the one that was talking about um, doomers again. Mm-hmm. You You'll have to check out the show about how we're doomers and it was all full of apocalyptimism and all this shit. Mm-hmm. And I'm like saying, well, yeah, don't I seem like a fossil fuel show? Like I'm getting paid by the fossil fuel company to be a doomer, to make people, you know, be <laughs> I don't think so. And, you know, There's no so money either. in it. There's Sorry. no money in it. There's no Sorry. money in it. And I have none. <laughs> but I yeah. do want to also say. Thank you to everybody that donated because, and I will do this applause. Guess what? Yay! I have. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been drinking this funny coffee. My tongue is brown. I have enough. To... It is. I drink the mud water, right? And that makes my tongue brown. Okay. I have enough to get the new computer for the channel. So that's exciting, and I want to Good. thank everybody. And I'm going to tell you, you know, I, I it's different. We're not suing Super Chats. We're not monetized on this channel. So I, I'm not going to give names. I'm going to just say thank you. You know who you are. And there's some very generous, beautiful people. And thank you for liking us, subscribing, for buying us a coffee, and now we can get the computer to run this thing. No Jennifer. more ice packs. No more fans. What are no, we going to do? No, hopefully not. I know because I was actually chilly tonight. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's see what you guys have out there. Um, anybody have any comments before we go? We are just hitting that. We're at, we have two minutes to the hour mark. Uh, anybody have any questions or anything they want to, uh, I mean, honestly, Anybody want to comment on my new uh, fossil fuel shill position? <laughs> <laughs> Which one should I pick? Should I pick Aramco or BP? <laughs> I, I mean, it's really tough. Well, <laughs> BP needs beyond petroleum, not British petro- petroleum. Right? All right, beyond petroleum. There we go. All right. No, they changed their name. They changed their name they did from say it? British. Yes, they You're changed kidding. their name. No, they changed their name from British petroleum to beyond petroleum. It was a PR campaign. Where the hell have I been? Oh, They're my brought God. Brought to you by the same guys that caused that horrible um disaster in the gulf of mexico yeah. and oh yeah those was lovely it people 2011 or something remember yeah. when that whole yeah. thing blew up oh yeah absolutely yeah there was deep, water deep water horizon deep water horizon deep water horizon wasn't that yep. it yeah that was brought to you by bp if i'm not BP. wrong isn't oh, that correct I don't know if i want to be a shill yeah, for so. them well they're all oh, making record on, profits Sandy. You can They're make all a making bunch of record money. profits. I put this on my own Facebook because I'm so sick of half the people that follow me. Yeah. And I, I was like, um, not the do, not the climate change people, but people that don't know anything and how the profits. I mean, the companies literally like Chevron and Shell, they have doubled their 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 quarterly. The first quarter of 2022 is doubled from the first quarter of 2021 in profits for their fucking shareholders and their CEOs. Flush that Double. toilet. Flush right, it I'll now. Flush it again. This flush is the it. first show we've had two. Two. We're going to flush those assholes. Double. And so it's 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 all I mean, you know, if you if even if you if you're 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 in the the stock market, it's still it's still not you're not getting it. The CEOs and the shareholders are the big shareholders. So, there you mm-hmm. go. All mm-hmm. right. So Kim put down um Thanks for coming. Please make sure to like and share the page. She's the best mod. Best mod. Mm, Matt's usually best. here. I think, what is it, 2, two or 3 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow in New Zealand. It's already, it's, it's already but um, anyway. Yeah, I know. Gary says, uh, Environmental Coffee House, oil grew the population. Now it's running out. We cannot sustain it. So you think it's not the thing I should not take any money from them? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, because they're going to suck. Well, they already do suck. Oh, wait. He says, I, uh, I don't have a big dump sound. Dan says, do I have a big dump sound? No, but I bet I can find one. <laughs> I don't have the plunk. I have, uh, let's see, I think I have, I have um, the drip. <laughs> that sounds about it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it is an hour and one minute. Thank you for coming. Mm-hmm. Jennifer and I will be back together on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Not sure what I'm going to do Friday yet. I'm not finished with my uh, video for um, showing you my trip, you know, the, the environmental degradation in New York by mm-hmm. the religious community. Um in called Curious Joel. I haven't had time. I'm just doing so much outside. So they all know yeah. I was wide. I, I did my, my impromptu live stream whining yesterday. So Jen, anything you wanna any wisdom you want to Well impart? I think it's been a it's been a great show. We keep learning a little bit, but um you know I wanna pose that question again and put it to you all. What is life gonna be like in twenty fifty along all these different dimensions, right? All the different measurements, all the population, the food, everything like that. So mm-hmm. that is twenty eight years, right? Twenty fifty is twenty eight years from now. So what's life gonna be like in twenty fifty, in case you're interested in investigating that? Yeah, well, I'm sure we will because if we're here, if if twenty, we'll still try to be here. We might be rolling up in wheelchairs, <laughs> but we could try. There's Tandy. You know? I know the Arctic's gonna melt. I know it's gonna melt. It's gonna melt this year. It's 2075, and I've held out for all this time. I know it's gonna melt. Fucking see it melt. <laughs> God. See, if you don't have humor in these serious situations, you ain't got shit. And on that note, good night. We love you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Pink Barrio, for coming.